I've been homeless for the last 16 years. This is why. Part 3 Basha, her voice quavering, was the first to speak. Now what? I turned to Carl, expecting him to say something, but was surprised to hear the words come out of my own mouth, seething with a fury I never knew I was capable of. Now, I said slowly and deliberately, now we kill every last motherfucking one of them. Damn right. It was a voice I didn't recognize. In the intensity of the combat, we'd all completely forgotten about the five miners towards the back of the cave. Three women and two men, none of them out of their teens, stared on in shock. They were too surprised to join in the fight, but they all desperately wanted out of there, and though they were weak, we knew as we traded our knowledge and experience that they would fight to the very last. There was no chance we could persuade them to let us take the fight to the Beatles alone. We stood and sat in the burning orange of the torches and the brilliant white of the flashlights, always watching the cave entrance as we talked. There were eight slaves down here, a much smaller group than ours had been. None of them had been down here for more than a few months, and it was then that Bisha realized that these beetles were smaller. Not by much, but it was noticeable. This beetle colony must be younger than ours. The miners figured there were only about 30 beetles. Closer to 25, now that we'd killed these ones. Rosa, a 16-year-old German girl, was somehow able to distinguish between them, although they all looked the same to me. She had even given them names like Dark Claw, Shiny Top, and Bent Tooth. With paper for the first time in the four months she'd been in the darkness, she wrote them all down and crossed five names off. There were twenty-four remaining. Of course, we couldn't know how many there might be which she hadn't seen. I asked where the other three slaves would be. Martin, a Slovakian boy, said they hadn't seen where they went. But it would probably be the forge, guarded by the two beetles who had come in last. So Basha and I headed to the forge and found the three, still working, and brought them back. The last two beetles we had fought had come from the forge when they heard us fighting, and we didn't encounter any more on the way. Eleven humans, led by the three of us who were more experienced and not weakened by the conditions of slavery. Our eight new recruits chose their preferred weapons from among the picks and hammers and my spare billhooks. Had a little to eat and drink, not too much, said Carl. Your body's not used to it. And then we walked silently along the long, wide tunnel to the main cavern. If we were quick, the others may not yet have realized anything was amiss. In the dim light of the slave pit's distant torches, we could see four or five beetles wandering about, doing whatever it is that beetle slavers do when there aren't any slaves around to torment. We huddled around to whisper our tactics, always wary of the beetles' excellent hearing. And as we discussed our options, their advantages and pitfalls, Bors, a boy from Jordan, said simply, What about the gallery? The shop, Carl, and I looked at him in astonishment, though we couldn't read each other's expressions. What gallery? whispered Carl. Bors pointed up. The gallery, above the entrance to their home. You could pick them off from there with the guns. I looked, and could just make it out. About ten meters up. Something like a balcony ran along a quarter of the cavern wall on the opposite side to us. If such a thing existed in our old home, none of us had noticed it. A few minutes later, we had a new plan. We would sneak around the edge of the cavern, enter the insect's home, and try to stealthily make our way up to the gallery, as Bors called it. Carl, having traveled to the entrance two days earlier, led the way. In absolute silence, trying not to breathe or even emit any smells, and occasionally freezing if a beetle looked like it might get too close. It took us maybe half an hour to travel a hundred meters. We only noticed the beetles when they chittered or moved in front of a torch, and we weren't doing any of that. The entrance, a tall, wide, rectangular hole in the cavern wall, was as much in darkness as anywhere else. Somehow we got there without being spotted. Carl felt his way along the wall and led us into a room on the left. We filed in silently, and Carl brought out one of his weaker glow sticks. We were in, as far as we could tell, a tool storage room, 
A cube hollowed out from the rock, barely big enough for us all to fit in there. Wooden tables, seemingly of human craftsmanship, lined the walls, and on these tables were all manner of strange tools. I could hardly guess at the function of most of them, and some of them I didn't even know how a beetle could manipulate them. I didn't care. The room had just one entrance. As long as no beetle needed a tool, we would be safe here while a small group scouted the rest of the complex. This time it was Carl and I who moved silently through the caves by the dim light of a glow stick, while Bashar stayed with the others. There were a couple more rooms storing various equipment. In one, we found obviously human artifacts, such as watches, credit cards, and mobile phones. We made a note to lead the survivors through here when we were sure it was safe. A long corridor led past these rooms and to a crossroad. We took the left path first. In the living area, there were occasional patches of some sort of gently glowing moss, barely enough to see by. But it meant that we could usually get away with putting the glow stick away. We soon came to an opening on our right and carefully stepped through. I froze. And I can't speak for Carl, but my heart dropped into my stomach. The faint light of the moss in the room shone green reflections off the glossy armor of maybe a dozen beetles. Carl and I stood motionless for what seemed like an eternity, until I felt a gentle tap and then a tug on my shoulder. Very carefully, very slowly, I edged back out of the room, and we made our way back to the crossroad. In furtive whispers, we discussed what we'd seen. The beetles were laying on the ground, on what looked like a bed of dried leaves and undergrowth. I recalled a suggestion by Nita, that beetles as large as these would use a tremendous amount of energy while active, and that they may sleep a lot more than humans. Carl proposed that if there were indeed about thirty beetles, it seemed that only half or a third were awake at a time. We decided to leave them alone for now and continue exploring. We crept back down the corridor past the sleeping area, and came to a small room just before the corridor bent around to the left and started to rise. We guessed it would take us to the gallery and decided to check out the room before making our way up. This room had a bit more moss. I could make out Carl's face and the smooth round walls of the cave, which was only about six meters across. In the middle was a raised platform, about waist high to a human. For some reason the thought of a baptismal font came into my mind. We edged slowly towards it. The platform held a rocky bowl, about 40 centimeters wide, filled with water. The water seemed to reflect more light than it had any right to. And as I peered into it, I did not see my reflection. I saw somebody else's face. She was about 20 years old, with pale freckled skin and curly hair. I didn't recognize her. I asked Carl what he saw, and it was the same. Then he pointed to another platform, a small table. On it were a few pieces of chalk and about a dozen slates. The topmost slate held a drawing of the same girl we saw in the bowl. This was it. My heart pounded. This was how they got us. I couldn't fathom how it would work, but they used this bowl, or one like it, to seek us out, mark us, and bring us here. The slates must be part of it, perhaps they saw many people in the bowl and drew the ones they decided to kidnap. I whispered excitedly we could destroy the bowl and stop at least this beetle nest from bringing anybody here. Carl disavowed me of that idea. It would be a simple matter for the beetles to just rebuild. Like I'd said just a few hours earlier, we needed to get rid of them all of them. For now, then, we would continue our exploration. We could always come back. We left the round chamber and continued on, along and up the tunnel. We were right. The slope led us up into the main cavern. We made sure the gallery was empty, then lay down and peered over the edge. Watching from safety, we realized there were only three beetles on patrol down there. Twenty-nine, minus the five we had killed, and the three on patrol, left twenty-one unaccounted for at least half of which we'd found sleeping. A tug from Carl. We were on the right most edge of the gallery, so every so slowly, and keeping as low as we could, 
We hugged the wall and edged along it. As we suspected, there was another corridor leading down from the far end of the gallery. We had crossed over the entrance to the living quarters and were on the other side. We'd been gone quite a while now, and Basha and the others might be getting worried. We agreed to explore this area and head back. Several twists and turns later, the corridor widened and straightened, and I estimated we were back on the same level as our companions. Dimly illuminated in front of us by the occasional patch of glowing moss, we could see three openings on either side of the corridor. This time, I was the one to touch Carl's shoulder. I'd heard movement. We watched in silence, Carl pointing the pistol, me with bill hooks in each hand. Three doorways down, a shadow. Quiet chittering. The faint outline of a shiny black carapace. Moving where? We stood as quiet and motionless as statues. The outline got smaller. A few moments later, the shape rounded a corner and was gone. Ten minutes later, Carl and I dared to breathe again. Carl stayed put while I gingerly pushed forward and moved my head into the nearest doorway. No beetles. I did the same for all six entrances, keeping well enough to the side to give Carl a good shot, if he needed it. All were now empty. I returned to Carl, and we entered one of the rooms. I'd taken the beetles for Bronze Age creatures, but what I saw blew that notion out of the water. Now granted, my understanding of tech trees is limited to playing Civilization Roman IV when I was twelve. But these guys were well into the Renaissance age, and maybe a lot further. Glass jars and tubes indicated they knew chemistry. Samples of strange powders lay in shallow curved pots. There was a setup of lenses, which I took to be a form of microscope. We moved on to another room. Here were gears, some sort of half-finished clockwork contraption. I'd seen the beetles grip things, but had no idea they could be so dexterous. I made a mental note to examine a front claw if I got the chance. Another room had something I remembered from back in school. Different colored metals, placed in a rectangular box full of liquid, and metal wires coming out of them. The beetles were making electricity. The other rooms had contraptions neither Carl nor I could even guess at. They were clearly scientists, some of them at least. I would have found it difficult to operate their machines with my human hands. Their inventions were obviously designed for beetles, but their purpose eluded us. We didn't stay long, ever wary of the slightest noise. Besides, we'd been gone maybe two hours at that point. At the end of the corridor, another passage went left and right. We very carefully peeked around the corner. No beetles, and not too far away on the left. We could just make out the crossroads from earlier. Slowly, silently, we crept back, made a left turn, and returned to the group. I'd been a little worried that they might have got impatient, or assumed us captured or killed. But there they were, some asleep against the walls, some playing cards in the dim light of a blue glow stick. Basha got up and gave me a long hug. Are you okay? Did you find a way out? Carl and I woke everybody and drew a map. The storage rooms where we rested. The strange bowl of water. The bizarre science laboratories. The gallery, with entrances at either end. And the room where many of the beetles lay sleeping. We get them. Now, before they wake up. It's near the end of the workday. It was a boy about 18 years old, whose name I hadn't caught yet. We need a plan, Carl said. We can't go rushing in. But it was too late. The boy had already stood up and was on the move, as quickly as a person can move without making a sound. Basha turned to Carl and I. We have to. Hell will be on us in a few minutes, whether we go with him or not. And so all eleven of us grabbed our equipment and stealthed away. Carl put a hand on the boy's shoulder and persuaded him to listen to his plan. If the plan hadn't involved killing the beetles immediately, I doubt the boy would have slowed down. When we got there, it was clear that the beetles had moved. None appeared awake, but I knew that they had shifted around in that room at some point in the last couple of hours. At Carl's direction, we moved silently into the room, 
shifting around to position ourselves in pairs near a beetle. But we weren't all in position yet. A chittering came from outside. The beetles started to move, all at once, and were upright in less than a second. I'm not sure what happened next. Everything moved so fast. I swung my bill hooks. Muzzle flashes lit up the room and rang in my ears. Curses in half a dozen languages. I tripped on the leg of a beetle. It pinned me to the ground. Mandibles snapped centimeters from my face. Helplessness. I was dead. Bang, bang. The beetle's head exploded. I pushed it off me, got to my feet. Another was next to me. Pincers slashed my arm. Bill hooks swinging right and left. Its legs ripped off. Bang bang bang. A third to my side. A slash to its thorax. And a pickaxe from the dark into its head. The next where was the next. I saw nothing. Bang. Blinded by muzzle flashes. I could make out nothing else. Three strong light sticks hit the floor and two flashlights searched the ground. Chitinous limbs lay scattered about. Black fluid oozed like ichor from dozens of wounds, and there a human arm, a foot, a leg with bone sticking out. Did any get away? Carl made no pretense at stealth now. I don't know. I didn't see. They're not moving. Did we get them all? Slowly, we started to calm down, as we saw no motion from the oversized bugs. But to be sure, we went methodically from one to the next, severing the heads of those who still had them. We counted fifteen beetles down. We'd had the element of surprise, but it wasn't enough. Four of the rescued slaves, slower and weaker than Bishat, Carl and I, were among the dead, and two others lay dying beyond hope. We had all sustained injuries, and I counted myself lucky to have received a mere flesh wound. As an ex-soldier, I don't envy what Carl had to do next. After we made the two mortally wounded girls as comfortable as they could be, Carl whispered to them. He never told us what he said, but I saw each in turn nod their heads. Carl then brought up his pistol, and with a single shot to the head each, put them out of their misery. He kneeled down in silence for several minutes. When he stood up, Basha put her hand on him. Are you? Don't. There were five of us left. Basha, Carl and myself, plus the German girl Rosa and a Polynesian boy named Selma. We knew we hadn't got all the beetles, and stealth was off the table now. It was me who spoke first. There are two directions in the living area we haven't tried. Left at the crossroads and straight past the workshops. If there's a way out, it must be one of those. Left was closer, so we went that way. I wish we hadn't. The corridor bent ever so slightly, just enough to block our vision until we got there. When we rounded the last corner, we saw what has haunted me every night since. I call it the throne room. She was bigger than I would have imagined possible, at least eight meters tall. Her body was swollen and her abdomen dripped with mucus. Around the room lay dozens of eggs as big as my hand, some intact, others broken open. As her enormous compound eyes turned on us, her mouth opened wide, revealing hundreds of sharp teeth like no beetle I've ever seen. The shriek that came from that mouth cannot be described in words, except to say that it froze my blood. But then, a human voice. It's got no mandibles. It was true. No mandibles and no limbs. It was helpless. Basha and Carl opened fire with everything they had. The queen thrashed her body violently and spewed dark liquid in our direction, but it didn't last long. Basha showed off her markswomanship and Carl demonstrated how quickly he could reload the pistol. The queen gave a final screech and collapsed to the ground, shaking the throne room like an earthquake. Helpless, I thought. I was wrong. Selma had caught the worst of the sticky black substance the queen had sent our way, and was down on the ground, struggling to move. And then we heard it. Hundreds of chittering, clicking insects came from all around the room and Selma was their first meal. The beetles that swarmed him barely came up to my ankle, but there were too many of them. Selma was dead in seconds, or at least, I hope he was. Run, said Bashai. 
and none of us argued. There was only one way to go, one corridor we hadn't tried. We made it to the crossroads, and Carl threw an industrial glow stick ahead of us as we turned left. More beetles, adult-sized, were speeding towards us. We ran with every ounce of strength down that corridor. We didn't know if it was our best option, just that it was our only option. As we fled, Carl and Basha turned to take shots at the enemy. We hurtled past the corridor that led to the workshops and into the unknown. Even with the covering fire, the beetles were gaining on us. But after 50 meters, we saw a light up ahead. I grabbed a flashlight from Carl's belt and pointed. The tunnel ended ahead of us, and another tunnel continued, nearly two meters above us. A tunnel made of earth and roots. A tunnel through which shone daylight. With an almost inhuman burst of speed, Rosa leapt and scrambled up the wall and into the earthen tunnel. Go, Basha, I cried, putting my hands down to push her feet up. Basha climbed up and grabbed a root. The root gave way, and the pressure as she fell back on my hands was almost too much for me to bear. But I wasn't letting go so easily. I pushed with all my might, and she scrambled to safety. Basha turned back and leveled her rifle at me. Blam! Blam! A beetle, now dead, hurtled into my back and knocked me to the ground. Basha reached her hand down, and I grabbed it. Carl was shooting fast enough that the beetles were advancing slowly, waiting for an opportunity. With Basha's help, I scrambled up and looked back. Carl shot again. Click! Bill hooks, shouted Carl. I threw both of mine down to him. He caught one, while the other clattered to the ground. Run. We ran. Carl was surrounded. There were at least four, maybe more, of those beasts around him. He had no chance, but he didn't try to escape. I hope he took a lot of them down with him. I know that none of them followed us into daylight. We tried to help Rosa, but she wanted nothing to do with us anymore. I can't say I blame her. After we stopped running, miles from the caves, she left us with barely a word. I don't know where she went. We emerged, we found out later, in the forests of Romania. Basha and I are an item now, and Hannah is arranging for a house to be built for us with no doors or windows. We've talked about kids, but we have no idea if the curse would pass to them. Nineteen of us entered doors that day. Four of us arrived in the same cavern, but months later, we haven't heard from any of the rest. We thought there was just one system. We know better now. These things could be everywhere. With luck, killing the queen is enough to shut down that particular nest. But there are only three of us with a curse, and Rosa hasn't joined our Discord group. Carl and Phoebe are dead. Fifteen others are unaccounted for. If anybody takes the fight to the Beatles again, it will have to be a new generation. Basha and I are retired. We just hope that our story here might be of use to our future comrades in arms.